Hello and welcome to our class for week 11. This week we're going to be focusing on play in early childhood education. So let's look at our agenda. I want to first remind you that their language and literacy development profile is due on week 12, which is next week. So if you have any questions about that assignment, please email me or post it on the Q&A for the professor on the discussion board. The second thing I want to quickly go over is the plan change for language learning environment assignment, which is due on week 14. Then we're going to get into play and early childhood education and the activities that you're going to be completing on the discussion board this week. And then I'm going to go over the homework. Okay, so the plan change for language literacy environment assignment is an assignment in which you're going to look at the classroom environment and I know right now it's digital and it's very atypical but imagine your focal child in a classroom environment and what changes or what adaptations you think should be made to that environment in order to help your particular focal child. There is an exemplar uh, provided by a former student Valerie Green on Blackboard that'll be a really good one for you to, to look at because there are um, some specifications for this assignment. So not just propose two or, th or three changes to the environment, but you need to base those changes on the observations that you've taken of your focal child. And you also need to link those to standards. So look at Valerie's exemplar for this assignment and really um, see how she developed it. If for some reason, because I remember Valerie's assignment was really, um, was a really big file and sometimes I could not open it or post it onto Blackboard. If not, there's gonna be another assignment that, that will be an exemplar as well. But look for the exemplar on Blackboard and go through it. And again, if you have any questions, Either send me an email or post it on to the discussion board for uh, the Q&A for the professors, which is on um, the discussion se session, the discussion section on Blackboard. Okay, so let's get into play. So there are certain characteristics for a scenario in which children are interacting that are going to allow us to identify it as a play scenario. So one is that uh, play needs to be intrinsically motivated. So it needs to be something that is coming from within and the child is motivated to do it because they have, um, they're motivated intrinsically to do it. So there's no external reward to participate in a play activity. It's also freely chosen. So the child selects what they want to play with. It's not um, imposed by an adult. It might be invited by another child, but it's the, the child who's participating in the play scenario freely chooses to engage in that activity. It typically is pleasurable, enjoyable, and engaging for the child. So there's, there's this intrinsic pleasure that comes from the experience. It's done for its own sake. So we don't necessarily play because we're gonna develop certain skills or we play because we need to get ahead in our play abilities in comparison to others. Or It's done because it's pleasurable, it's enjoyable, it's intrinsically motivated, we've chosen to do it. So it's done for the play activity itself. It tends to be active. And by active, we mean it can be both physically active and intellectually or mentally active, right? So it, it, it tends to be uh, an activity in which the child is engaged and is actively participating in. It's self-oriented rather than object-oriented, meaning that you do it you're, or the child engages in play because there is a self-satisfaction rather than there is a product or a goal to be a material tangible goal to be achieved right it can be non-literal 
which means that it can be make believe. And when we look at children, we t we see this often. The children engage in make believe or fantasy kinds of play. On that note, we're going to look at the different types of play. So we have, and in this image, you have two classifications of types of play. So you have one classification that has the rough and tumble play, imaginative play, object play, body and movement play, and, and playing with games. And then you have the other classification that talks about active play, make-believe play, manipulative play, creative play, and play for learning. And if you look at them side by side, the active play has a lot of similarities to the rough and tumble play. The make-believe play has a lot of similarities to the imaginative play and so on. So these correlate to each other, although um, the authors are giving them different names or different titles. So the rough and tumble play is a type of play that requires or demands from the, the participants a lot of physical activity. And there is a lot of physical contact between the players. The rough and tumble play we see it, it's more prevalent in boys than girls, and it's more acceptable in some cultures than others. So with this type of play in particular, although all the types of play we're going to see that this is true for all of them, we want to be very respectful of the child's background and be um, very mindful of why the children are engaging in these types of play. So imaginative play is the type of play in which the children use their imagination. They use, for example, objects that, not, that are not necessarily for that particular purpose, for a purpose that serves their imaginative play. So this is why there's a parallelism with this um, make-believe uh, title for this type of play, because they, they, they use a lot of fantasy in imaginative kinds of play. And they make believe that things are a certain way to serve the purposes of their play. Object play is um, play with puzzles or uh, blocks or uh, manipulatives uh, to, 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 to make something. So it, it has sort of like an end goal, completing the puzzle or building a block structure, etc. Um, and it involves objects. So the, the child is manipulating different objects with a particular goal in mind. Body and movement play are more, um, instead of the rough uh, or versus or different than the rough and tumble play, are about using your body in creative ways. So dancing, um, doing arts and crafts, doing, uh, playing with audiovisual um, games, those, those would be body and movement kinds of play. And then lastly, games are, uh, are, are play that involves, um, certain skills to, to achieve an end. And sometimes games can be competitive. So they're t the type of play that we engage in, maybe in groups and small groups, and maybe in teams with one team uh, playing against the other, and there's sort of a competition. So that's another type of play in which we can see children engaging in. So for the stages of play, we're going to see that not all children enact the same types of play at the, at, at the same time or are able to engage in the same types of play at the same age or level of development. So from this uh, table, and this table is coming from a book uh, by Feeney, Moravic, and Nolte that is uh, titled, Who Am I in the Lives of Children? And this is particularly from the uh, 10th edition from 2016. But this uh, table, I included it because I think it gives us a really good view of where the children are in terms of age, which is this column right here, the first column on the left, and then the different authors and researchers and scholars who have come up with different stages that children go through from their um, theoretical framework that children go through as they advance in age and development or in regards to play. So we see that 
We have Piaget's stages of cognitive development and Erickson's, sta Eric's, Erickson's stages of social-emotional development here. But then we have Piaget's stages of play because he talked about play as well. And then we have Vygotsky's levels of make-believe play who also talked about play. So Piaget, Erickson, and Vygotsky's focus of their work is not necessarily play, but we can see that they contributed some uh, stages and interpretations of how children play to the field of, of play. If we look at Parton stages of play and Smolansky stages of play, these are the two main authors that we look at when we talk about uh, trying to identify in which stage of play a child is at by observing them play. So Parton stages of play talk about solitary play where children play alone with toys there might be other children close by, but they're not noticed by the child who's engaging in solitary play. Then we have a parallel play where children play side by side and they each have their own toys. They might be aware of the other person being there close to them and that might be pleasurable for them, but they're not engaging. In, in play with them. Associative play is when you have pairs or groups of children playing together and they're sharing materials. But there no, there isn't a um, cooperation, there isn't a planning together to reach an end goal. It's more of, oh, I see you're using the blocks, maybe you can use this one, and I see you're using these uh, plastic animals, maybe you can use this one but it's not about working together with an end goal. That would be cooperative play. And so the cooperative, cooperative play is the most advanced stage of play in which groups of children can come together and plan and negotiate and share responsibilities and leadership and have an end goal to which all of them want to get to through the play, right? So a group of children come, say, to the uh, dramatic play area and they want to play restaurant and so one person is the cook and the another person is um the the patron or the, the person that's coming in to eat and another person might be the waitress and then they play they assign roles and each of them know who they're going to be and they carry out this fantasy play scenario um in a very cooperative kind of way the other author from the stages of play table that is uh, well known for their contributions to the field of play is Smolansky. And Smolansky talks about functional play, constructive play, dramatic play, and games with rules. So for functional play, children engage in sensory and motor exploration of toys and materials. And... Um, they do this because they're curious, because they want to find out how things work. Um, they, they want to know, they want to learn about the world around them. And you can see here, if you, we correlate the stages of play with the age of the child, you see that that happens early on in life when the, the, the child is still an infant. Then you have constructive play where children are starting to manipulate objects to create something, right? So she, she's not looking at it from, um, Smolansky isn't looking at it from a social interaction, but more of how the child is using the objects that they're playing with. So in constructive play, they're using the objects to create something. In dramatic play, children may, might use objects um, in representation of something else, like they can use a banana as a as a telephone, or um, they can use um, a scarf as a cape, and and they're using these um, elements in representation of other elements that are going to contribute to their play scenario. So that's the dramatic play. And the games with rules is where children uh, establish rules and play according to these rules. And um, there's a lot of sort of negotiating of the rules have not been met and what it means if you can continue playing or not because of, because of the rules that, that we all agreed upon if it's a group of children playing together. So you'll see that, again, these correspond to different stages of development and ages in which the children will find themselves. And again, these are fluid, meaning that children can go through these stages 
a little quicker than others, or they might stay in a particular stage a little longer than their peers. And it's going to depend because development is fluid uh, from child to child. Okay, lastly, we're going to look at the teacher's uh, role in play. So you as a teacher have several ways in which you can support and participate in play with the children that you're that are uh, under your charge, right? So you can be the stage manager, meaning that you set up the environment, you select the materials, you choose the books, you choose the posters and the um, uh, displays that you have in your classroom and orient and organize the furniture in certain ways to allocate for space. And so you set up the stage. The other thing that the stage manager does is controls the schedule. So the stage manager or the teacher in this role will allocate specific amounts of time for play. So that's another way that you can really support play is to allocate enough time for the children to engage with these materials and the equipment that you selected for them. And another thing that, that plays into this role is that the stage manager needs to know very well where the children are developmentally and what kinds of play are they going to be engaging in according to that those stages of play that we just talked about. And organize, again, the classroom, the schedule, the environment, select the materials all around their knowledge of the child's development and of all the children that, that she as a teacher has in her classroom. Another role that the teacher is going to play is as an observer. And this is going to be key because the, the more and the better we observe children, the more we know about them. So an observer is going to be someone that is going to be watching in on children playing and taking notes of what's going on to be able to determine what kinds of play or, or types of play are being enacted and in which stages of play development the children uh, find themselves at a particular time. The mediator and the protector role is the role of the teacher when the teacher inserts themselves maybe into a play scenario and mediates conflicts and, and sort of tense situations that might arise between the players. Um, and the protector means that when something like this, when a conflict arises in a play scenario, the teacher wants to mediate to protect the play, to protect and make sure that the play continues to take place. So if, for example, two children are fighting over an object and both of them want to play with that object at the time, the mediator teacher would say, would introduce maybe another, a second object that the children could play with instead of that one that they're both um, coveting at the same time, right? So you want to introduce things into the play scenario to protect it, to allow it to continue to happen and for it not to stop. The participant role of the teacher is when the teacher is immersed in play with the children. So in, in this image that we see here, maybe the, the teacher is taking that participatory role and is playing, is engaged in playing with the child. The participant role can be important because it can serve as the next role as a tutor where you're modeling for the child what's going on, but you're also um, having fun with them and modeling with them, for them how to play and the benefits of playing, the, the satisfaction, the joy that comes from a play um, interaction. So one thing to be uh, cognizant with the participant role is that the play is for the children and sometimes as participants we get very excited about the play and we tend to sort of dominate the play and we need to be very cognizant of not doing that because again the play is the a play is the way that children learn and is the way that children are going to process everything that they're learning about the world around them about the world outside the classroom and about the world inside the classroom so you want to you want to participate to be able to tutor and model but you want to be able to recluse yourself from the that activity and or at least let the children take the lead 
The tutor role, as I said before, is is sort of a modeling role where you model for children how to play and sort of the benefits of play. Um, in the tutor role, we can see that we can find children that are expert players and children that are not that great at inserting themselves into a play scenario. So a tutor role can be, um, for example, a teacher that sees a child looking in on a play scenario and you can tell that they want to participate but they don't know how you might give them an object a toy a manipulative and suggest that they take this into the play scenario and offer it as something that could advance the play for the children that are in that play scenario and that would be a play that would be sort of a way in to that play scenario that that the teacher can facilitate that for the child that is struggling with getting themselves immersed in that kind of play. And then the last role is assessment. And this is uh, comes very uh, close or, or uh, in company with the observer role, because in the assessment role, you want to really gauge what children are learning and taking away from play scenarios. So not only to be able to assess them and see what stage of play they're at, but also seeing what is it, what skills are they learning through these kinds of activities? What knowledge, what content are they gaining? What understandings are they, uh, new understandings are they embracing? So the assessment component is going to be um, key as well. So some golden rules for play in early childhood education. You want to provide enough time of uninterrupted play. You can do this several times a day. You want to facilitate plays that are that are indoors, that take place indoors, and that take place outdoors. So the ideal play um, time or time provided for play is 45 minutes to an hour. And sometimes this is not possible because it's too long of a chunk of time to provide um, in a continuous way, but you can uh, chop this off up in several times a day. So you can have two half an hour periods of play or, um, you know, three 20 minutes periods of play, but you want it to be free play and uninterrupted where the children can really come up with ideas and uh, not only plan them, but uh, take, uh, put them into action and see them through. And for that, they're going to need time. Um, the second rule of play in early childhood ed is to choose play materials to meet the needs and the interest of your students. So really observe your your that the third one is observe children playing, but really observe the children playing so that you can select the materials that really are meeting their interests, that the children are excited to play with. And also observe the children to be able to know in which development stage they are at and to select materials that will challenge them, that will support them in their continuous development. So that, that would include that observe children while they're, they're, they are playing. Add materials as play happens to expand the play. Like I, I um, mentioned before, a teacher that sees children play fighting over something can add materials into that scenario to help children sort of dissipate that conflict. Um, you can help children enter play scenarios like I'd explained before in that tutor rule where you suggest um, a child contribute something to a play scenario so that they can insert themselves in it. Uh, participate but let the children take the lead. So remember that the play is, is for the children by the children. <laughs> And you can be participating, but you can't take over, right? So they need to be the leaders. Avoid teaching and instructing concepts during play. So the, the focus and the goal of a play activity is not necessarily for them to recite the numbers or identify the colors or tell you what letter this is and how do you write this and what does it say over here? It's, it's not necessarily about that. It's about them using those skills in order to enact a play scenario, right? So it's not about the skills themselves. So avoid teaching and instructing um, in a direct way concepts or, or uh, aspects of your curriculum during uninterrupted free play. And then redirect play if necessary, but do not stop it. So you want to really preserve the play scenario and keep it going.
Okay, so the first activity we're going to do is we're going to watch a video of children playing in the block area and we're going to try to identify the type of play that's being enacted by the children, the stages of play demonstrated by the children, the role played by the teacher, even if we don't see it, the teacher in the clip, think about what role the teacher played in order for that play scenario to be able to occur. And then the area of development and particular skills that are practiced or learned by the children by engaging in that type of play. And this, we're, you're going to complete it on a discussion board. Okay, this play scale was something that I included from the same book from um, Feeney, Moravec, and Nolte, 2016, Who Am I in the Lives of Children, the 10th edition, because I thought it would be a good template to, to take a look at for observing. So when we're observing children play, we want to know exactly what is it that we're, that we're trying to look for, right? So you want to look for um, maybe the cognitive levels of play, and this comes from, um, from Piaget's levels of play, or, and um, Smolansky as well, functional, constructive, dramatic, and games. And then you're going to see the social aspect of play here from Parton the solitary, the parallel, the group, and you can add associative or cooperative play is this group one here. Um, and this will help you to know exactly what is it that you're looking for in terms of uh, observation, right? So you can have the name of the child, the, the time and date of when the observation is occurring, and then your notes here um, about what you are observing while the child is playing. So this is a template, an observation template that you could use. Okay, the second activity that we're gonna focus on is to write an elevator speech for play. So an elevator speech is a very brief speech that you pitch to someone and some some call it the elevator pitch instead of the elevator speech but it's a it's a brief speech that you pitch to someone to convince them of an idea right and we're going to base this on soto manning's um our, the the brief article that we read for this week that talks about children's right to play so looking at play not as a privilege but as a right that children have. And so if we if we know that play one is the best way that children can learn, the easiest, the fastest, the most developmentally appropriate way that children can learn. And we know that we believe that this is the right of children, that this is a right that children have. It's not a privilege to play, it's a right that they have. So we want to make sure that our classroom schedule includes a lot of time for free play because that's where the learning, the developmentally appropriate learning is gonna happen in our classroom. So what I'm asking you to do is think about encountering a person that is a non-believer in play, a person that thinks that direct transmission, that um, academics, that math and literacy is what's important and that children, the younger the children get this or get um, a start on learning math and literacy, the better they'll do in life. And if you do it in an academic direct instruction way in which you're transmitting your knowledge to the children, then that is the best way to learn because that's how adults learn, right? So if you encounter a person like that, what could you say? in a very brief elevator speech kind of way to this person that would change their mind and would help them understand the importance and the benefits of play for children's learning and development. What would you say? So write a brief elevator speech that would, and it's called an elevator speech because it's about the time it would take you to ride in an elevator with that person. So that's the amount of time that you have to convince this person that play is important, is needed, and is the right that a children that children have in order to learn and develop in an appropriate way. So think about that. Um, and there's a discussion board this week for you to 
share with us your elevator speech. What would you say to this non-believer um, to convince them? Okay, so that is it. These are the references that I used. Um, Developmentally Appropriate Practice in Early Childhood Programs, the DAP book that we've used before, and then the book that I mentioned, Who Am I in the Lives of Children, uh, were two sources that I used for this presentation. The homework for this week, you have admin slip number eight, or admin ticket number eight. Uh, we have three readings this week that you should be including in that admin ticket. Then you have the focal child observation number six of your focal child. And then uh, the discussion board activities that we have. One activity is observing children play in the video and the other one is your elevator speech. And that is all for this week. I will talk to you again soon.